Welcome to Love You a Brunch, the podcast for foodies and those who'd rather be brunching. Hi, I'm Jody Stapler. Today on Love You a Brunch, we'll be talking to Gerhild Falsen. Gerhild is the founder of Just Like Oma, but not only is she a cookbook author, she is involved in missions outreach in Germany in her spare time and is also a website developer and a YouTube star. So stick around with us after these sponsors and learn about German Meals at Oma's, traditional dishes for the home cook on Love You a Brunch. Willow Moon Publishing provides podcasting, print, ebook, and audiobook publishing services. We work to provide access to quality books that all too often are overlooked by the big five. Our goal is to help authors who tell engaging, dynamic, and compelling stories bring their work into the hands of readers. For more information about our books, our authors, our podcasts, or working with Willow Moon Publishing, please visit us at willowmoonpub.com. Did you know you could find Love You a Brunch on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube? Please check us out, follow, and subscribe. Also, if you'd like to ask a question or share a story, Skype us at Love You a Brunch. Or visit us at our website, loveyouabrunchpodcast.com. Or you can email me at loveyouabrunchpodcast at gmail.com. We are speaking to Gerhild Falsen today, and Gerhild has written um, a couple cookbooks. Um, how many has it been so far? Oh, I have about, I think, eight um, eat cookbooks, and this is the first print cookbook right now. Okay, and this one is called German Meals at Oma's, Traditional Dishes Up for the Home Cook. And right. um, that's because you have a German background, right? That's correct. Okay, so so tell us a little bit about your background and, you know, where you live and, and just everything you can think about. Oh, everything. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, my parents immigrated uh, from Germany to Canada. I live in Canada right now. And that was in the early 1950s. And so um, I grew up totally as a Canadian. However, my mom always cooked German. She loved the German foods. That's what she was used to. And so she would uh, uh, cook the foods um, to try to replicate the flavors that she was used to, that her mom had taught her. And living in Canada in the 1950s was very difficult to find German ingredients and things like that. So she would have to play around with the recipes and try to make them fit. And so that those are the kind of recipes I grew up with. I married my husband, and he was also German background. His parents had also come over at the same time period. And so we grew up in this environment where we knew what German food tasted like, but we'd never actually been to Germany. Okay. We, my husband and I, we both went back to Germany. Oh, let me see. It's been in 2006 was our first time ever back to Germany. Wow. It was our first there. And so for us, it was, a, it was a brand new experience. We took a bus tour that took us through all the regions of Germany. Wow. And uh, it, was, it was an amazing trip. We had gone over because we we're both involved um, in uh, Christian ministry. And we had gone over to Germany to see what things are like over there. Yeah. And so while we were over there, we visited um, on the bus tour. We visited all the old towns throughout all of Germany, and it was amazing. And while we, we had the foods there, and it was delicious. And, um, and so on this trip, we realized, uh, we also had an opportunity there to minister, and we realized there was a great need for um, Christian German resource material, and we thought, oh, we should put that online. I had never done anything online before, and so the easiest thing for me to do was to create a website about something I knew, which was German cooking. Mm -hmm. And so that's how the whole idea started with the recipe site was just to learn how to use um, websites and technology. Okay. And, and so that's how my, you know, the whole thing started with having a website and having recipes online. And then I just got carried away with that. <laughs> I just, I mean, come on, you know. <laughs> yeah. And part, part of it was the, when I was over in Germany, I realized what I knew as German food growing up in Canada was just a touch different 
than what was actually in Germany. Right. And um, I realized as well with the website, I have a Facebook page with a quite a large following. And the people that were on my Facebook page were basically Americans. They were also Americans that came over at the same time period, many of them. Mm. And mm. so their recollection of what they knew German food was, was the same thing as me. For example, when I'm over here, I grew up with potato salad. And I mean, I love my German potato salad, and it's made with mayonnaise. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I started posting that online, people were very upset with me. They were telling me, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> they said, that's, that's absolutely not German made, uh, potato salad. And I'm thinking, of course it is. That's the way my mom made it. Yeah. And it wasn't until we were over in Germany, I found out that Southern Germany makes their potato salad totally different than Northern Germany. Hmm. And so all of those people that came originally from Southern Germany, they just knew what they knew. And they didn't realize, like I didn't realize, that it's different in other parts of Germany. Right. And so theirs down there, they would never, ever, ever put mayonnaise into theirs. Okay. And so it's, uh, there. then I became, I became aware of the great regional differences. Um, Germany is made up of all these small little places that have history, which involves totally different countries. Uh, like the moment you come closer to the French border, of course, you're going to have influence with France. Um, and then you, in, in the north, and, and then, of course, you had the whole thing with eastern Germany or in other parts where... Perhaps the agriculture wasn't as good. And so you had these huge differences in uh, foods and ingredients that were available that totally influenced the same dish. Mm -hmm. And and so that I found very interesting. And so when the opportunity came to write this book, when I was approached by Page Street Publishing to write them a cookbook, I thought, oh, well, this sounds like an interesting thing to do, to literally travel through Germany, through all the regions that my husband and I had taken on this bus tour, and to see what kind of foods there are in those countries or in those parts of Germany and how different they are than literally the same food in the other part of Germany. Yeah. And so I, I love that part about your book. I love going through each of the different sections of Germany, um, the States and, and go ahead and say it in German for me. What's the word for States? Um, Oh, <laughs> I got it. it's, it's in your book. I just don't, I, I, there's no way I can say it. <laughs> uh, Bundesländer. Sorry. There you go. That's <laughs> okay. See, my so, German is also, I, you know, I, I was raised in English. I, my yeah. German had to come back the past 10 years because we've been going back and forth to Germany every year as we minister. And so the German had to develop in both my husband and myself. We had to learn it. Right. Right. So when, when your parents moved here, where did they come from? They came from the area around Berlin. Okay. And did they, so they weren't speaking much German around the house when they came or? Um, they did. A, okay. A bit, a bit. But you see, they came to the point, they came to Canada because they wanted to make a better life for their children. I was only three yeah. years old when I came over and yeah. my older sister, and they wanted a better life for us with the situation the way it was in the fifties over yeah. there in Germany. Yeah. And so their idea is we're coming to Canada. We, we have, we're going to become Canadians and we need to learn the English language. Wow. And yeah. so, um, that's what we did. They started speaking English. They learned the English quickly. And that's what we talked at home. Now, sometimes they would talk German so I could understand German, but mm -hmm. I couldn't really speak it. So it, when we went to Germany for the first trip, I could understand what was going on. But the language to be able to speak it myself yeah. um, was a difficult thing. Okay. And what part of Canada did your family settle in? Uh, Southern Ontario, around okay. Hamilton. Area. And was that like a big German set settling area or? No, not at all. No. Okay. So, wait, sorry. When we first moved here, we moved to Northern on Germany, uh, okay. sorry, Northern Ontario around Sault Ste. Marie. And there, there were, oh, maybe just a couple of German people. Oh, okay. And then we moved down towards Hamilton area. Okay. It's funny because, you know, I live in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, which is right. also a very German, it's a German settled area. Yes. Um, and it, people always hear Pennsylvania Dutch. They think we're talking about Holland, but it really is Deutsch for German. Yes. So um, a <laughs> I can hear a little bit in your right. accent, the same accent that um, some of the people that really like really keep that strong Pennsylvania Deutsch accent going have a little bit of the same accent that you do. So you do have it there. That's for sure. <laughs> well, that's, you're, you're actually the first person that's ever mentioned that I have an accent. <laughs> oh, well, you know, here I am in the States. I have one too. So <laughs> we definitely can hear it. 
I'm sorry. I'd love the Lancaster area. We often come down to watch the Sight and Sound Theater. Because... Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. It's a very nice theater down here. Um, yeah, we get a lot of big bus tours in for that. So um, I also going through your cookbook. It's funny because I recognize a lot of different, it, they're a little bit different, obviously, because when people come, they settle and they get whatever ingredients they have around them. But it's very similar to how my mother cooked. Ah, yes. And my mother was probably, I mean, we've, we've been in America for generations and generations, but those recipes get carried down along the way. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the cabbage, a lot of, um, you know, of course, sauerkraut's huge around here. I mean, on New, New Year's Eve or New Year's Day in Pennsylvania, I don't know if you if it's how it is with where you are, but we eat pork and sauerkraut on New Year's Day as a good luck thing. That's our meal. Yes, that's very German. Very yeah. German. Yeah, because they, they say that the pigs root forward, whereas a lot of people have chicken, and they will root for their food backward. So we want to go forward in I the coming that. year. I hadn't heard that. I, yeah. I, what I've heard is that the sauerkraut, all the little pieces of sauerkraut, supposed to be like, I have no idea. Yes. I just remember thinking, oh, that's interesting. But Yeah, that's the second part. It was, um, for one, it's, it's supposed to bring uh, financial gain with the sauerkraut. Okay. Kind of, uh, and also it cleans you out for the coming year. I think that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> that works. <laughs> <laughs> but I did find it really interesting. One of your, um, one of the little notes that you put in here, and you call them, oh, what is it called? Oma's. I can't even say it. Ek Oma's Eke. Okay, and that's what is it? Uh, grandma's Cor corner. Cor grandma's corner. Like we're, sitting in, we're sitting in the corner chatting. <laughs> yeah, right. And one of the little time, uh, one of the little ones that you have in there is mentioning caraway seeds yes. and how it's not just there for flavor, but also to help with those some unpleasant things when you're eating sauerkraut. Yeah, I heard that too. And I thought that's interesting. And it's interesting that they're often added to foods that would cause gas. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I never know, knew that before either. So that was really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so tell me one of your favorite recipes from your cookbook. Okay, one of my favorites is one that, okay, when I, when I did the cookbook, I had a lot, a lot of research because I'm thinking, I really don't know what the traditional foods are for those areas. And so yeah. one of my favorite ones that I, that I came across was this thing called Bloom Coal Bombe, which is cauliflower bomb. Oh, yes, I saw that. Yes, and I thought, well, isn't that interesting? And it is so good. It's the first time I made it. I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, this has become our favorite food. Yeah. It, it, I mean, when you, if you have a dinner party and you have it on the table, people look at this thing and say, what is it? It's right. a huge ball covered in bacon, literally. <laughs> yeah, well, explain it to us so that people that are listening can <clears throat> hear what it is. Well, you take a cauliflower, you don't take any one too big, maybe a two pounder, nothing huge, huge. And you take the cauliflower and you cut it flat so it'll stand flat on the table, but then you cook it until it's almost, as a whole piece, you cook it till it's almost totally tender, but you don't want it falling apart tender. And then you take this cauliflower out of the boiling water and you place it on your baking dish or your big casserole dish. And in the meantime, you create almost like a meatloaf. Uh, other ground beef, like a meatloaf recipe. And then you very gently pat this meatloaf in a layer, maybe an inch thick, all the way around your cauliflower. So now you've got this whole cauliflower ball or bomb sitting on your plate. It's covered with about an inch or so of um, this meatloaf recipe, which I include in there, which is a really good one. And then you cover that whole thing with bacon, strips of bacon. And who doesn't love bacon? I mean, it's come on. And and then this goes in the oven. It doesn't, even though it, does, it ends up being quite this big ball, Yeah. Um, it doesn't take long to bake because your cauliflower is the whole center part. It's already cooked. Right. So all you have literally is this one inch layer of meatloaf covered with bacon. So it takes up an hour in the oven. And then the while that's cooking, you use some of the water that you boiled the, ca the um, cauliflower in because it tastes a bit cauliflower-y mm -hmm. and then you turn that into a sauce. You take some of it and you make it into a sauce. So you've got this um, creamy white cauliflower tasty sauce with it and you serve that. All you need are some, well you don't need much with it, but just some potatoes on the side and right. it is so flavorful. And it's like, yeah, with bacon, anything tastes good. Yeah. But 
<laughs> it, it looks interesting. It becomes, it, it's like, oh, this is good. My, my hubby first tasted it was like, all right, this is a winner. Like uh, yeah. this is what I make more often. And it's, it's really easy if you think of it, but it's, it's a, it's like, wow, this is, this was nice. And uh, so that, that became a favorite for sure. Yeah, they, German um, German folks really do like to put stuff inside of other things. <laughs> yeah, it seems like <laughs> um, they they have. Um, what's the one with the egg that's made made inside of? Is it meat or? Um, there's two of them actually. There's a meatloaf. Uh, we have a meatloaf that my mom, when we grew up as kids, she would call it falsche Hase, and falsche Hase means false hair or like a rabbit, a hair. Okay. okay. So it's like false rabbit. This way, I, as a child, when you grow up and you hear this false it's like, um, it's it's like <laughs> it's like a rabbit, but false rabbit. I never really knew what it was, and it, it's meatloaf is what it is. Yeah. It's more than a meatloaf, and I guess the shape of it, the shape of the meatloaf, looks like a rabbit. I don't know. Oh, yeah. So like it's you know a long loaf shape, and it would be called in our area of Germany. That is in northern part in Berlin area. It's called Falschehase, false rabbit. And on the inside, when you're making this meatloaf, you um, insert hard-boiled, peeled hard-boiled eggs, so that you like when you make when you form the meatloaf, you have a layer of meat on the on the on the pan, in the pan, and then you put let's say three, you line up three hard-boiled eggs in there, and then you cover the rest with the meat, so that when you later on cook it and then cut it in slices, you've got the slice of meatloaf that has a circle of a of an egg in there. Mm. And it looks so pretty, and especially for kids or for company, if they don't know what you've got, and you slice into it, and you like you're expecting just meatloaf, and all of a sudden there's this nice little, you know, white and yellow egg in the middle of it. It looks really right. pretty. So that's the egg inside that one. The other dish is what we call Schwalbennester, which is swallow's nests. Okay. And these are um, they're made either with veal cutlet or a chicken cutlet, very thin. And you take your very thin piece of meat, you put maybe cheese on there, you put ham on there, and then you put this hard boiled egg, and then you wrap it all up and you cook it. And it, they call it a swallow's nest. Very nice. Yeah. It's almost like, I think over in, was it Scotland? They've got the egg inside. Um, right. What is that called? Um, oh, I can't remember what it's called. Yeah. No. But I, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Only they use like a ground meat and we actually use like a, a cutlet of veal or chicken. Right. Right. Well, and I love, I, I'm, I'm going through your book and I'm, I love just the little names that they had for things or when you take the German word and put it into English, like rat's tails. Oh, yes. <laughs> Hamlin's rat's tails, which of course comes from uh, Lower Saxony, yes. um, where, you know, um, Pied Piper? Pied Piper comes from. So, yeah. So, and that, of course, you're not using rats. That's funny because when the publisher, uh, when they first approached me to write the book, I had to then create the manuscript after they asked me. And one of the recipes I had in there was called Rat's Tales, right? This one yeah. here, Rattenschwanze. And one of the comment, the questions back from the editor is, is like, is this using real rat tails? Like, <laughs> like they just want to make sure it's not. <laughs> right, right. Because where would you get that? <laughs> Absolutely. And it's interesting because it is only a recipe. It's one recipe that is used in this one restaurant. I mean, they've, they've, they've turned this whole thing into a tourist thing. It's an actually interesting place to go. We were there uh I think two years ago again, and the whole town is set up for this whole thing with the Pied Piper, and they've oh, got cute. this huge building, and they've got, um, oh, they put on the play uh, with, with kids and everything else, and it's out in the streets, and they've got music, and it's it's, it's just, it's, uh, I hate to say it's a tourist trap, right? But right. <laughs> it is. And but you can't not, you can't go there and not go to it. I mean... <laughs> You've got to see this, and it's it's fun, and it's 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 fun. The story itself isn't very fun, but right. it's done very cute. And so this restaurant puts on this dinner, and it's this meal, and you can have these rat tails for dinner. And <laughs> but so, but they've got this secret recipe, and it's a, their secret recipe. So you really can't find it. I mean, you can Google online for it, and pretty well, there's I think one recipe online for it that everyone copies and calls it their own. But you know. <laughs> And it's this, this recipe. So that's the recipe I had to work with as well. Like, how do you try to bring this across? And it uses things like wine and port and, and apple brandy and all this other stuff. And so I turned the recipe and made it more 
children friendly. So, yeah. You know, something that can Oma would do. And right. so we, you know, we use chicken strips and, and, you know, baby corn and, and it's, it's actually quite good as well. And I thought, Oh, I like this one too. This, and it's, it's, uh, it's a fun type recipe. And uh, so you tell your child the story, maybe a bit, um, uh, you make the story not quite so horrific. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. make it more fun. And then you serve this dinner of rat tails. Very cute. And for those who don't know, Oma means grandmother. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So that yeah. So this is basically like as a grandmother, this is this is how you would cook for your family. And yes, right. Yeah. Yeah. Make, Very make, nice. The kids love it. Eh? Yeah. And you know, I'm. You know, you always think of potatoes as an I. You know, they always say it was an Irish thing, and I guess that's because of the famine. But really, Germans use potatoes in almost everything. That's true. <laughs> so I almost feel like it, they really are more of a German thing than an Irish thing. But I mean, there's some here that you, the, of course, the potato pancakes, which very popular in my house growing up. Fried mm -hmm. potatoes, another thing very popular in my house. But you have the um, German version of like what would be a gnocchi, gnocchi. Yes. Um, but it's what is that one called? Uh, I did top tip of my tongue. Uh, Schupf noodle. Schupf noodle. Yeah, um, not a very not a very flowy off the tongue language. <laughs> <laughs> a little guttural. It's, it's, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, Schupfen means to sort of throw throw off, and so these these noodles are made with a potato dough, uh, literally mashed potatoes that you add a little bit of other stuff to, and you create a, literally a nice dough out of these potatoes, and uh, you take little bits of it and you roll them in your hand. And as you're rolling the one in your hand, you sort of throw it off your hand, uh, throw it between your hands off. And that's the terminology schupfen. And so this schupf noodle, um, you literally create, they almost look like fingers. Mm -hmm. And there's some other, uh, there's another name for it that I won't mention here because it's not quite appropriate online. What the schupf <laughs> is. And uh, anyways, it looks like a finger and it's sort of pointy, a little bit pointy on both ends. It's the final picture that you can visualize of these noodles and that's about the size of them too. So you cook them uh, in boiling water until they're done, which is only a few minutes. And then they are fried in butter. You know, we mm. love butter. Uh, we use lots of butter or bacon fat in our cooking. And mm -hmm. so they're fried in butter and some of them or mostly they're used as you would for a savory meal, like to go along with meat, but they can also be sprinkled with sugar and cinnamon and used for dessert. Ooh, yeah. yeah. I, we've n I've never done that for sure, but yeah, yeah, that sounds delicious. Absolutely. So you brought up butter, which reminds me in, in your book, you mentioned that there was um, a, a version of butter that you really couldn't get when you were growing yes. up. Yes. And what is that? Butterschmalz. Butterschmalz is like uh, clarified butter. That's actually what it is. Mm. And uh, I know over here now we can get it in, uh, because of the Indian influence and in that we have ghee right. available. Okay, so it's similar to ghee, only ghee has more, a slightly nuttier taste to it. Mm. Uh, butter schmaz, you literally, you just melt butter. Um, and I found that, I mean, you can just put in your slow cooker to melt it very slowly, and you'll end up getting a scum layer on top, and you take that off, and then you pour off, I call it liquid gold, and then the bottom has your milk solids, and you don't touch that, but that liquid gold in the middle is a butter that you can fry with that has a higher burning point so that your meats don't burn as quickly. So you can use butter then to cook your food to get that flavor without having them burn. Yeah. And the ghee, you make the ghee the same way, but in the slow cooker, you leave it there longer, and that those butter solids in the bottom become darker, and that okay. flavors your... Um, the uh, clarified butter a bit more, but we take it off just before that. Yeah. I love that you add all of that in there and so that people can do that for themselves. Cause I am all for making things at home instead of going to buy it at the store. So, so yeah, that's awesome. Um, again, I love how you split through the book um, with the different regions of Germany and you tell a little bit about each little area and it's almost like a travel book at the same time as a cookbook. Mm -hmm. Yes, that was my idea. When we took our first trip to Germany, I said we took this bus tour that went through all the states and it was so nice just to see the different areas. The landscape was gorgeous. I had so much trouble trying to choose which picture was going to represent which 
region in the book because I mean you get to southern Germany you've got the Alps in there you've know, got the Bavaria mm. and northern Germany it, it's like it, it's so different and so pretty and so I thought there's some way to make the cookbook yeah. Try to make a person want to go back to Germany and visit. You know, do you want to go over there and try the foods over there and see these gorgeous places? Right. Well, I I love the cookbook. Um, of course, like I said, it reminds me of how my grandmother and mother cook. Um, of course, the German uh, potato salad as with the mayonnaise was exactly how we had it growing up. Um, Very good. But you do also put it in here without mayonnaise. I sure do. And it's funny because most of my followers on my Facebook page are from Southern Germany. I realize that's where they come from. And that's why whenever I put anything with mayonnaise, the cucumber salad is another one, mm, for example. Yeah. I'm used to sour cream in mine, not mayonnaise, but sour cream. Yeah. And they, theirs is absolutely, it's a clear. And, and then I, I have to mention as well, I say Northern Germany uses mayonnaise and or sour cream and Southern Germany doesn't. That's not totally true because you'll find some areas in Southern Germany that does as well. In some areas in northern Germany, that doesn't. So, I mean, there, there's variations as well. But generally speaking, that's, you know, it's northern is, is creamier and southern is not. And I wonder, as I'm talking of it right now, I think maybe southern is warmer and you need something that's a bit um, refreshing. Yeah. You know, and the creaminess is this more comforting. It's, you know, colder area. So maybe that's the reason why. I don't know. Yeah, it makes but, sense. And uh, also maybe with it warmer, you wouldn't, you know, you couldn't like have a picnic with it sitting out. The mayonnaise might go bad. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a, ama it's an amazing cookbook. I really, I'm going to, I'm going to go through it and, and really cook some of these for my family because, you know, over the years that the German, like I said, my gen my family's been here generations, like since the 1700s. So, um, so all those recipes have gotten muddled and muddled over the years. And so, what you finally get for a goulash for a, my family is not what you have in here. And I've never liked ours. <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna uh, definitely try some of one of these in here that you have. Awesome, awesome. I look forward to hearing how you like them. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so you have a pretty huge following. You have a YouTube page. You have a Facebook yes. page, and I found a couple different websites with with uh, uh, yep. information about you. So um, mm -hmm. how long That's have true. you been doing this? Well, when we, as I said, when we first went to Germany, it was 2006, okay. and we came back. And my purpose at that point was to write a German website. Yeah. Now, you have to remember, my German was next to nothing. My husband was better in his German. And um, and so now we're going to go and, 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 and write a German website. I didn't even know how to do a website. Yeah. And then that in the German language. So then I started with the company. Uh, I took a, a course uh, to learn how to do this. And for me, the easiest, and, and at that point, I also started going to Bible college. So I was a little busy and I thought, how am I going to learn to do a website? And I'm going to Bible college and I'm still doing other stuff. And so I thought the easiest thing to do a website on is in cooking. Yeah. And then I thought German cooking because I like cooking German food. And so that was how I got into doing a website. And so once I had learned how to create the website, I had it going. Then I created the German website. So that's where you find a German website. That's gotteswort.org that we have. And that's become quite large. It has a huge following as well, especially on Facebook. And in, and in all places in Brazil, we have a huge following in Brazil on there. Wow. There's a lot of Germans down there. I didn't realize that. Me neither. And uh, I mean, on the, on our uh, gotteswort page, we have like over 200,000 followers. Wow. And most are Brazilian, Brazilian Germans. Wow, that's amazing. And, I know. I, I, that, I, I learned so much doing all this stuff here. Yeah. And then, so we've got that website. And then I so much enjoy doing websites. I also created my own publishing company as far as online stuff. So I do, uh, I, I counsel and coach people to, to create websites for business, etc. And I, so I do that on the side as well. Wow, you're a busy woman. That I am. <laughs> That's fun. I enjoy it. I only do it because I enjoy it. I don't have to do any of this, but I do enjoy yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I totally understand. I'm right with you on that one. I have to keep myself busy, for sure. Uh, <laughs> so, um, where can everybody find your book? Well, you can find it pretty well on any online bookseller, and it became available in the bookstores. As of yesterday, that's when the actual physical launch was. So, nice. uh, until yesterday. so that was um, November 13th. That's correct. And so that okay. was the launch date. And um, yeah, and so now I, I'm not sure where the publishing company and the marketing company, they put them all over in the States and in Canada in the bookstores. 
and uh, but again online any any online seller and because my name is so unusual the name Gerhild is a very unusual name even in Germany the moment you put my name into one of the search bars in the bookstores you're pretty well come across me because there's not many of us right so even how if, exciting yes <laughs> very good so and what is your website where they can find you as well they can find me at justlikeoma.com. Very good. Just like Oma, right? So just like Oma. Yeah. Com. I love it. I love it. I have a Facebook page. You'll need to go onto that one. And then off the page, there's also a group. And we call ourselves the Cuffa Clutchers. And the Cuffa Clutchers, which is the Cuffa Clutch, is where you gathered around Oma's table, having coffee and cake and just chatting. That's a Cuffa. Uh, how sweet. I love that. And so you, you come and join the Cuffa Clutch group because there you'll find all these people just loving to talk about German food. And um, it, it's, it's a lot of fun. And we share recipes, we share traveling in Germany, and it's, it's a place where people come. You can either write in German or English. Everyone's happy with both languages. If you read one or there are people translate for you, whatever. It's, it's a really cool group to be part of. Oh, that's very cool. I will definitely oh, check that out. And I have one more website. I didn't mention that. I have my store, too, because I sell German Ooh. stuff. I sell my ebooks on there. I sell cups and T-shirts and aprons and all that kind of stuff. But things for Oma, again, uh, many people can find a cup, you know, to give to your grand, to your Oma. Uh, but yeah. don't use words like Omi. Omi and OP uh, are words also used. And so I've got things for Omi and OP and Fati and Mummy and all these things on there. So that's my other website as well. I love it. My, I'm going to have my sister uh, is about to become a grandmother. So she's been looking for a name to call herself. Uh -huh. And, you know, she doesn't want the normal grandma. Uh -huh. So um, oh, me I, I, yeah, I have to tell her about that. That's cute. Um, anything else you would like to tell everybody before we head out today? Oh, just enjoy German cooking. And you want to cook just like Oma, right? Absolutely. It's it's such a comfort food, to be honest. It's hearty. It fills you up, and there's just something about it. So definitely recommend everybody go out and get it. It's a great little travel guide as well as a cookbook. So thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you, Joey. I want to thank Gerhild Falsen for joining me today, and I want to thank you for joining me as well. Please take a look and try to find Gerhild on the Internet. You can find her at quick-german-recipes.com. You can also find her on Facebook and YouTube. And make sure you pick up her book, German Meals at Oma's. Join me next time when I speak with Dan from America's Test Kitchen about their new cookbook on Dutch oven cooking. I'm Jody Stapler. See you next time on Love You a Brunch.